Whilst every legion of Starte suffered throughout its history, both before and after its separation, perhaps none have paid as steeply as this one. Based on a toxic world and cursed with a genetic flaw so profound as to threaten their very sanity, this legion nonetheless served with honour and distinction during the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy. Their Primarch was perhaps the most revered and beloved of all the Emperor's sons, especially in the aftermath of the Galactic Civil War that would ultimately take his life. Today, we have come to Cygnus Prime, a quarantined world in the Ultima Segmentum that almost destroyed the Legion in order to tell its tale, simply because their home is besieged by two independent forces and it is much safer to come here. Led by the Primarch Sanguinius, known more commonly as the Angel, they are the ninth Legion Astartes from the world of Baal. They are the Blood Angels. This is their story, from conception to separation. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to Legions, a 40k Stories miniseries. The Ninth Legion Astartes were founded on Terra, presumably during the Unification Wars, from the gene seed of the Primarch Sanguinius. No records exist of any previous names or heraldry for the Ninth, so we must assume that they were always known as the Blood Angels, if they were even named at all. Given that many legions had established traits even before they found their Primarch, such as the Word Bearers or Iron Hands, it is also likely that the Ninth were already renowned shock troops early on, as they became known for rapid strikes and devastating assaults, something of a hybrid of the Lunar Wolves and World Eaters, I suppose. The reason I'm having to make these assumptions and educated guesses is because of the fact that literally nothing is known of the Ninth Legion's actions before they came to Baal. We don't know if they fought the Unification Wars, nor do we know of any battles pre-Sanguinius for that matter. Further compounding the issue is the fact that we don't know of any individuals who are known to have served before Baal either, which suggests that the Legion Master pre-Sanguinius was killed at some time during the Crusade after the Primarch was found. This lack of information is perhaps surprising, given how famous the Blood Angels and Sanguinius were and still are today, but I assume that that fame is more due to the Angel than his sons, and so their pre-Primarch times are poorly documented. That said, I am hopeful that more information will eventually surface on the tales of the Ninth Legion in due course. However, the story does get more interesting at this point, for now the Great Crusade comes to the world of Baal. There, it finds the Tenth Primarch to be rediscovered, the Angel, Sanguinius. Sanguinius landed on the second moon of the planet Baal, known as Baal Secundus in the galactic northeast. Both the planet and its moons were desolated in ages past, wrapped by toxic and nuclear weapons that left them as wastelands. The populace survived, after a fashion, and by the time of the Primarch's coming only two groups remained, a tribe known as the Blood and hordes of mutants. Other tribes were either destroyed by one of these factions or assimilated into the Blood. Bar Secundus itself was highly irradiated, and either this, the manipulations of the warp, all the genetic manipulation of the Emperor caused Sanguinius to develop his famous angelic wings. The young Primarch was taken in by the blood, and like all his brothers he developed rapidly, being taller than the rest of the humans even before his first birthday. Between this, his prodigious strength, and his seemingly powerful gift of divination, he rose to become the greatest of the blood, and led them to victory over the mutants once and for all, at which time he was pretty much elevated to godhood. Whilst he was loyal and friendly as a person, if you roused his ire, then you were in all kinds of trouble, for Sanguinius's wrath was nigh unstoppable. Eventually, the Great Crusade arrived, though it is unknown what the time difference was between the victory of the mutants and the coming of the Emperor, and the Lord of Mankind came to Baal in disguise to hear Sanguinius speak. After the Primarch spoke, an impassioned speech to be sure, the Emperor assumedly revealed himself, but Sanguinius already knew of his gene father's coming, and so recognised him on the spot. Unlike the similarly prescient Conrad Kurz, however, the angel swore allegiance to the emperor immediately, without the need for any foreboding chatter between the two. The Ninth Legion were past the Sanguinius, and the best of the blood were inducted, and it is confirmed that at this point the Legion took the name of the Blood Angels. The first battle Sanguinius is known to have fought in with the Legion was on the world of Tegar Pentaris, and it is from this fight that the Primarch gained his ceremonial cloak by slaying a Carnodon, a huge feline creature that can be up to six metres long. 
As weapons, he wielded a gene-coded sword known as the Blade Enkarmine, of which weapons similar called the Glaive Enkarmine would be wielded by his bodyguard, and the Spear of Telesto, which could supposedly vaporize any who did not share his bloodline. During the Great Crusade, the two Primarchs with angelic epithets formed an interesting rivalry due to the similar attack styles of their legions. Sanguinius and the Blood Angels were perhaps less powerful at hand-to-hand -hand combat than Angron and the World Eaters, but they made up for this with an increased versatility and an understanding of compassion. Very often, ultimatums would be issued to any world chosen as a campaign target, either by Sanguinius himself or one of the highest ranking legionaries known as Praetors. This offer was simple, accept compliance without a fight or face the wrath of the Ninth Legion. Although many foes were either too scared to fight or were simply in awe of the Blood Angels and thus willing to comply, many were not, refusing the offer. If that happened, then the world would face what would become known as the Day of Revelation, where the normally calm and noble Blood Angels would unleash their trademark assaults, causing ruin and death from above with perhaps unparalleled fury. Sanguinius himself was the most respected and loved of all the Primarchs, both by the people and probably his brothers. He was one of Rebuke Gilliman's dauntless few, signifying the trust the Lord of Ultramar had for the Angel, but it was Horus Lupercal that became the fastest friend of Sanguinius, though when this began is unknown. It was the Angel who encouraged Horus to rename his legion after Ulanor, and the Warmaster said on Davin that it should have in fact been Sanguinius who became Warmaster due to him being a fuller embodiment of the Emperor than any other. This included his psychic power, which explains why Sanguinius supported both the introduction and preservation of the Legion Librarius, and whilst he was present for the Council of Nicaea, it is unknown what role, if any, he played in the so-called Trial of Magnus the Red. In fact, it is probably the case that Sanguinius was the second most powerful psyker amongst the Primarchs after Magnus, and even if some other could surpass him in raw power, then none could hope to match the attunement he had with his sons, as evidenced later in the Horus Heresy. In battle, both Sanguinius and his sons were as near to perfect as they could be, always striving for a better tomorrow, even if their usually proud countenances would have to be darkened in rage to make it happen. At some time during the Crusade, however, this darkness began to manifest as part of what is now known as the Flaw. The red thirst surfaced, though when, where and in what strength it affected the Blood Angels is unknown. It is stated to have only been isolated cases at first, in which the unfortunate Astartes would seemingly abandon themselves and charge into melee despite holding a good position. But if a squad were to fall to the thirst, then this attack was often powerful enough to drive the enemy back anyway. When Sanguinius learned of the flaw, even if it had only affected a handful of blood angels, he took full responsibility and immediately began seeking a cure. This is an unsurprising sentiment, as it was of course Sanguinius's genetics that ran through every one of his sons. It is said that not even the Emperor knew of this, though being the Emperor he probably did, as Sanguinius worked to cure the floor in secret, and even when Horus found out, he kept his brother's secret. Tragically for the Ninth Legion, despite their continued efforts, the floor was about to get much, much worse. Even though he was the closest friend and advisor of Horus Lupercal, Sanguinius wasn't truly given a chance by the Warmaster to fall to chaos. Horus claimed that this was because of the fact that Sanguinius would never stand the chance of falling, but the Slaneshi demon Kyris instead believed that it was because the Angel would gain greater favour from the ruinous powers. Kyris would be tasked by Horus, along with the bloodthirster Kabanda, with eliminating Sanguinius, who had been lured right here to the Cygnus Cluster. His mission was supposedly to combat the Nephilim, who the Blood Angels had fought earlier in the Crusade on Melchior, and who had been exterminated later by the White Scars. Horus had told his brother that in fact the towering Xenos were not extinct, and as such a large amount of the Ninth Legion were deployed along with their Primarch. However, when they came to the cluster, it was instead demons who were waiting for them. The battle was fierce, and many Blood Angels died, but it was when Sanguinius dueled Kabanda that it all really went south. Whilst the Bloodthirster tried and failed to from convince Sanguinius of Horus's fall, he was able to knock the Primarch down and pretty much crippled his legs. He then went on to kill over 500 Blood Angels in succession, causing a psychic backlash so strong that it knocked Sanguinius out. This in turn triggered a surge of the Red Thirst within the Legion, 
who were able to drive the demons back whilst the Librarius tried and eventually succeeded in rousing their gene father. After banishing Cabanda, Sanguinis was given an offer by Kyris, step into a device known as the Rage Fire and cure the Red Thirst. Erebus had built the Rage Fire as a means to corrupt Sanguinius, who in fact accepted the offer such was his desire to cure his sons, but an apothecary known as Meros stepped through as well and refused to let the Primarch do it, giving himself up and becoming possessed by a demon known as the Red Angel. Not to be confused with Angron, whom the demon offered to fight if he saw an issue with the name clash. When the battle ended, so did the Red Thirst that the grip so much of the Legion, but the Sons of the Angel were not in a celebratory mood, despite a comprehensive victory, as they now knew deep down that the battle on Cygnus Prime had awakened a dark fury within them. It was fortuitous that the battle ended when it did, for Tylos Rubio of the Knights Errant was on Baal at the time, and if word had not made it back of the Legion's victory, then the remaining Blood Angels could well have been disbanded by Malkador the Sigilite. Following Cygnus, Sanguinius's forces was drawn to Imperium Secundus by the Pharos, and Sanguinius would reluctantly rule Gilliman's backup empire while simultaneously being cut off from the people. Because of the assassination risk, he wasn't actually allowed to go outside, and so the Sanguinor was birthed in order to act as his herald. During this short reign, Sanguinius would meet the now traitorous Conrad Kurz, with whom he shared a level of prescience and psychic power after Kurz infiltrated his palace on Macrag. The two spoke with Night Horta being particularly curious about why his brother still stood loyal given what their visions had shown, and Kurz then told Sanguinius that he had correctly foreseen the angel's death. Merely attacking the eighth Primarch, Sanguinius tried one last time to return his brother to loyalty, but Kurz refused and escaped before eventually being recaptured. First saving Night Horta from death at Lionel Johnson's hands, then having his own hand stayed by the Dark Angel Primarch, I can only imagine how confused Gilliman must have been, Sanguinius confided in his brother Primarch that he too had seen his own death coming, just as Kurz had said. Eventually, when the ruin storm faded, the blood angels of Imperium Secundus made all haste for terror and the destiny that awaited them. In the battle for terror, the blood angels were unsurprisingly heavily involved in the fighting. It is not known whether they were under the effect of the Red Thirst during the battle, but I would suspect a few brothers did succumb, as is often the case today. Sanguinius himself was not in the first line of defence, but rather the last, holding the Eternity Gate. Had this gate fallen, then the Sanctum Imperialis and the Golden Throne would have been next to fall, and the traitors would have won the war. The other Blood Angels supposedly could not withstand the onslaught, forcing Sanguinius to hold the gate alone for a time, but this is unconfirmed as the Ninth were also reinforced by Custodes and Imperial Fists led by Rogal Dawn. During this last stand, Cabanda returned, and the demon and Primarch jeweled in the skies as the battle raged below. Unlike at Cygnus, however, this time Sanguinius didn't end up on the wrong end of the fight. I know he won in the end, but we all know it had gone very wrong before that. It wasn't fast, and it wasn't easy, but Sanguinius triumphed, breaking Cabanda over his knee before rejoining the defence of the gate. Eventually, the time came for the Emperor to confront Horus as the War Master lowered his shields, and Sanguinius accompanied his father to defeat his greatest friend. For some reason, the teleportation separated the Imperial forces throughout the Vengeful Spirit, meaning that Sanguinius found Horus first. As Horus had predicted before Cygnus, Sanguinius never considered turning to Chaos, and once the arguments concluded, the two Primarchs came to blows. However, whilst this fight may have been close under normal conditions, the War Master had been blessed and empowered by the Chaos Gods, and so the battle went completely Horus's way. Sanguinius died before the Emperor could even arrive, but it is said that he was able to create a chink in Horus's armour that would be used by the Emperor to end the battle once and for all. With his death, a new aspect of the floor was triggered, the Black Rage. This sends the unfortunate victim into a near inescapable nightmare, a waking dream where they play out Sanguinius' death from the perspective of the Primarch, and it has claimed innumerable blood angels over the millennia. Sanguinius' body was then recovered along with the mortally wounded Emperor, and now lies on Baal almost undisturbed. A mutant warrior Fabius Baal did get very close, but it was put down by a sergeant with the aid of Chief Librarian Mephiston. In the aftermath, the blood angels complied with Gilliman's decree to separate, and are known to have sighed five successes at the time, 
though it could have been more. Obviously, with no Primarch to oversee this separation, whether Sanguinis would have approved, I don't know, it fell to the sole survivor of the Sanguinary Guard, Sanguinis' bodyguard, as Kalon, to divide the Legion. The modern chapter, and all their 25 known successors, and presumably the other ones too, have lived with the Black Rage and Red Thirst throughout the last 10,000 years, but have always strove to live up to the values and methods of Sanguinius. The chapter today is led by Commander Dante, perhaps the oldest non-Dreadnought Astartes in the galaxy, having ruled for over 1,100 years. It may be that the floor consumes them all, but the Blood Angels will never give up. Of that, I am certain. And so, with the tale of Sanguinius and his sons told, let us now explore a few famous individuals within the Blood Angels. The first captain of the Legion, and the equerry to Sanguinius, was Ralderon. Whilst his origins are in fact unknown, he was an incredible warrior, and though that is to be expected for a first captain, he was considered on the level of Abaddon and Sevatar in terms of skill, which speaks volumes if you ask me. During the initial fights on Melchior with the Nephilim that also included the Lunar Wolves, Ralderon discovered an Astartes who would succumb to the Red Thirst, this is I believe the first recorded case of it, before reporting to his Primarch. Sanguinius killed the Marine after failing to bring him back from his rage, and Horus was in fact present for this, which is how the future Warmaster knew of the Red Thirst. In fact, when he told Sanguinius to move to Cygnus, he told him the Nephilim had potential thirst-curing technology, which is a load of nonsense probably. Ralderon accompanied Sanguinius to Nicaea, having a heated debate with a certain captain who we'll be talking about a little later, but it seems that some parties within the Imperium did not trust the Blood Angels to follow the Edict. Following Prospero, Malkador assigned a Space Wolf kill team to the 9th Legion's mission to Cygnus, under orders to put them down if they used their psychic powers. Ralderon was shocked, but Sanguinius was having no dissent and so bonded them all in an oath of moment, which reaffirmed the faith in the Emperor and the Crusade of all present. Whilst most of the Legion succumbed to the Red Thirst with the incapacitation of Sanguinius, Ralderon's contingent was seemingly able to hold themselves in check. The exact reasons for this are unconfirmed, but the presence of a pariah in his team may have shielded them from the psychic backlash. The pariah marine wasn't normally with the first captain, he was merely a survivor who had been found by the soon-to-be-possessed apothecary, Meros. Given he was with Meros during the outbreak of the Thirst, it is perhaps a little surprise that Raldawan was present when Kairos offered the rage fire to Sanguinius, but despite being highly valued for his opinions and flexibility, the first captain was seemingly unable to deter the Primarch from this fate. Raldawan survived Cygnus, the various skirmishes in Imperium Secundus, and in fact he made it through the Battle of Terror as well, and when the Legion was divided by Azkelon, he was given perhaps the highest honour of all. One might have assumed that Azkelon himself would take leadership of the surviving Blood Angels chapter, but that task was given to Ralderon, assumedly for the reasons he was given first captain in the first place, flexibility in command, and the ability to relate and understand his brothers far better than perhaps any other. This latter trait would perhaps be even more important in the aftermath of the heresy than in the Crusade, as the Black Rage had now surfaced and the Red Thirst was far more present than before. There is conflicting evidence that suggests that Astarte's name Belarius was instead the first chapter master of the Blood Angels, but there is far more to support it being Ralderon, and so I suspect that this Belarus individual may have in fact been a successor or advisor. The eventual fate of chapter master Ralderon is unknown, as his tale ends after Sanguinius' body was returned to Baal, but it is assumed he served for a period of time and died whilst never succumbing to the Black Rage. There's no evidence either way, but a chapter master joining the Death Company would almost certainly have been recorded in the annals of history somewhere. Azkelon was the founder and leader of the Sanguinary Guard, the personal guard of the Blood Angels Primarch, and as such, he bore the title of the Exalted Herald of Sanguinius, a title still held by the leader of the Sanguinary Guard today. Perhaps surprisingly, given they were the two highest ranked Astartes in the Legion, Azkelon and Ralderon did not get on mainly because the Herald was about as inflexible as they come, and because he would sacrifice any Blood Angel if it protected Sanguinius. This was evidenced when Horus was found with Sanguinius on Melchior, for the whole executing the Red Thirst victim thing, which no Blood Angels actually knew about, and probably cost one of the sergeants of First Company his life at Azkelon's hands. He is not confirmed to be present in Ikea, though I'd be surprised if he wasn't as Sanguinius' chief bodyguard, and he was happy to go along with and enforce the decree 
which explains his shock at the Space Wall's purpose on Cygnus and the revelations of Magnus defying it. Speaking of the Cygnus campaign, Askelon seemingly took a back seat in the fighting, as he was separated from Sanguinius when the duel with Gabanda took place. He then stayed with the Primarch's body whilst the librarians tended to him, seemingly showing just enough flexibility to let the psychers work, but threatening them with death if any sorcery was performed. He then failed at bodyguard duty on the most epic of scales when Sanguinius recovered, abandoning his lord as the Red Thirst gripped him and the Sanguinary Guard. He then oversaw the withdrawal once it wore off in the aftermath. In Imperium Secundus, it was Askelon who suggested and then implemented the role of Sanguinor to act as Sanguinius' herald, with the Sanguinary Guard member Alatron being given the task in a manner that kept the Sanguinor's identity hidden. Basically two drew lots, one became the Sanguinor and the other was killed by Askelon. The Exalted Herald continued as bodyguard during their stay on Macrag, but could not stop Conrad Kurz from infiltrating Sanguinius' palace being used as an unconscious hostage by the Night Haunter to ensure the two Primarchs would converse rather than fight. I would slate Askelon for this, but it was Conrad Kerr, so I'll let it go. When the final battle came on Terra and Sanguinius joined the assault on the Vengeful Spirit, he was accompanied by the Sanguinary Guard, as one might expect. All save Askelon. Assumedly because he knew that the deaths of both him and his guards against Horus, Sanguinius asked the Exalted Herald to remain behind on Terra, Though exactly what your logic was used is unclear, as Askelon's actions post-heresy do not suggest he was being left to lead the Legion. As already stated, Askelon was responsible for dividing the Legion, but rather than assume command of the Blood Angels chapter, or indeed any chapter for that matter, he left that responsibility to the captains, and then went off the grid. No one knows where he went, and it's almost impossible to speculate. The Sanguinary Guard were reformed after the Battle on Terra, as all save Askelon were dead, as Sanguinius had predicted and it is the belief amongst these elite veterans that their founder would find his soul inhabiting the Sanguinor, who also vanished from all records after Imperium Secundus. Given that the Sanguinor has only spoken once to our knowledge through the past ten millennia to Commander Dante during the recent Cryptus campaign, it is likely we will never know if it is indeed the soul of Azkelon that inhabits this mystical warrior. Given we just visited Cretacea, I think we'd be doing its sons a disservice if I didn't tell the tale of their first chapter master. Nasir Amit, the Flesh Terror. Amit was the fifth captain of the Blood Angels, and was about as blunt as they come. If ever there were an Astartes who flew in the face of political correctness, it was this guy, and despite the Blood Angels being renowned for refinement and taste, Sanguinius held a great deal of respect for Amit's brutal honesty. Along with a mouth that pulled no punches, Amit had the guts to back it up, never fearing retribution from the Wardens, forerunners to chaplains in the Ninth Legion, Sanguinius, or perhaps even the Emperor himself. He was part of the cohort sent to Nicaea, and whilst he was firmly in favour of a Librarius, he was forced to stand guard elsewhere. Supposedly, Sanguinius was afraid his overly blunt captain would dare to challenge the Lord of Mankind when he delivered his verdict. That would not have ended well. Amit did vent his frustrations on Ralderon, and whilst he was warned that he was bordering on censure by the first captain, he was becalmed by the Primarch. Now, if you thought Amit was pushing his luck there, then he really put his Artificer Armoured boot in it when the Blood Angels came to Cygnus Prime, as he was the one to correctly suggest that the Ninth had been led into a trap by Horus, which saw him struck by Sanguinius and only saved from more trouble by the Space Wolves. Unfortunately, Amit's way of paying back the Space Wolves for keeping him from censure was, well, murdering them. When the Red Thirst swept through the Legion, Amit was taken by it, and he and his men cut the Space Wolves down. This would certainly not be the last time that someone from his lineage would kill allies in a blood rage, eh? He realised what he'd done as the battle ended, and he owned up to Ralderon before submitting himself for, in some ways, a long overdue punishment. He would never receive it. Askelon appeared and spoke to both the first and fifth captains, telling them that he had lied to Sanguinius and said the Space Wolves had been killed by demons rather than Amit and his men. The Exalted Herald explained that if the Primarch knew the truth, he would feel compelled to tell Lehman Russ, Primarch of the Space Wolves, what had happened, which would weaken the bonds between the Loyalists at a time where unity was key. As such, Amit was never punished and instead sworn to secrecy, though it was apparent that living with what he had done was shame enough. Amit survived the heresy and was granted command of a chapter when Azkelon divided the Legion. This new chapter took the name from the title of their leader, becoming known as the Flesh Terrors, 
It's unknown exactly when Amit was given this title by his brothers, though it was definitely before Nikea, but he embraced it all the same and in fact outfitted his company with flaying knives just to live up to it. Amit then took the Flesh Terrors chapter to the start, assumedly with the red thirst and black rage boiling just below the surface as it does in his sons today, and eventually they took Cretacea as their home. What exactly became of Nasir Amit is sadly unknown, though it will either have been death in battle or becoming lost to the Black Rage, I would suspect. Normally, I do not discuss events concerning a legion that are much later than the Battle of Terror, and I certainly do not discuss groups or individuals. However, I believe it only right in the case of the Blood Angels to make a partial exception and discuss the Death Company. The iconography and title of this group do owe their origins to the time before Terror, reserved for the rare occasions when the Red Thirst would claim an Astartes. The company markings of these lost individuals was blotted out with black paint, and the trend is now applied to the entire battle plate of those consumed by the Black Rage, who now form the Death Company. As for the name, it cannot be clarified for certain what the root is, but it is suspected to date back to Melchior and the discovery of the lost Astartes by First Captain Ralderon. Following the execution and removal of the Marine's gene seed, Ralderon spoke and said, You are in the company of death now. May you find peace there. As Ralderon would go on to lead the Blood Angels, it is possible that this remark would form the basis for the title, given that any loss to the Black Rage are treated as dead men walking by their brothers. The Death Company is only formed on the eve of a conflict, when the Blood Angels gather to pray under the watchful eye of their chaplains. At a specific point, certain Astartes will collapse, being caught by the descendants of the Wardens and being taken away. Their markings are removed and their armour is painted black, with a red cross to denote the wounds of Sanguinius that the afflicted will likely suffer in their visions. Granted full access to the armoury so they may die with their own choice of war gear, and with their plate bedecked in scrolls denoting the honours of their former service, these fallen heroes are shepherded into battle by special chaplains, who act as a beacon that they can follow into their deaths. In battle, the Death Company are granted a portion of Sanguinius' own strength, making them incredibly powerful tools on the battlefield, but they are never meant to live. With any luck, all will die in the battle, or shortly after due to severe wounds, but any who somehow survive are not returned to the fleet. Instead, the High Chaplain and Redeemer of the Lost, in the modern age's individual as Astarath the Grim, will come and execute them as they can sense the onset of the Black Rage before it even manifests or devolves into an inescapable Red Thirst. However, there are those who cannot be saved, all that fall into madness away from battle. These unfortunates suffer the worst fates of all. Where possible, they are returned to Baal and chained at the peak of the Tower of the Lost in the Chapter's Fortress Monastery. They will remain there, trapped in their visions, until they eventually die which probably takes a damn long time, as Blood Angels are remarkably long-lived amongst Astartes, as we mentioned with Dante. Only in two cases has the Black Rage ever been overcome, and only once seemingly fully. The now chief librarian of the chapter, Mephiston, somehow defeated and suppressed the Black Rage after a week of entombment under a collapsed building during the Second War of Armageddon. The chaplain, the Martes, has also been able to contain the Black Rage after a fashion being able to stay in control despite being under its sway. He now leads the Death Company, allowing those under his command to earn a measure of redemption and glory in death. But he is entombed in stasis between engagements to ensure he does not fall back into the Rage's control and attack his brothers. So ends the tale of the Blood Angels Legion. Sanguinius and his sons have one of the more tragic tales of the Loyalist Legions, even if they didn't play as much of a role in the larger heresy against the traitors, at least not compared to, say, the Iron Hands. An honourable and lethal force in equal measure in the Great Crusade, the Ninth Legion are now forced to battle against the myriad external threats as well as their own genetics in order to survive. But they are taken to this with great aplomb, even without the guidance of their Primarch. Now, it's time for us to sneak out of the quarantine zone around Sickness Prime. Wait on. There's going to be an Imperial Fleet Guard in this area, surely, and that is just the perfect excuse to explore the history and composition of the overall Imperial Navy. So, full power to stealth generators, let's explore these fleets and the tales of the Imperial Navy.
My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis. Thank you for watching the eighth part of Legions, our 40k stories mini-series, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.